Great. OK, perfect. Um, I think we'll start because we're already 10 past tw uh, 12 now, so. It's um, so if, if anyone hasn't met me before, my name is Mohammed. I'm one of the education fellows. I'm also a plastic surgery registrar here. Been working for about a year with BHT, uh, and I'm um, doing some sessions and help with the IMGs. And we had the uh, a few sessions together. And this is the first session for the forum. Um, it's going to run every two weeks with different topics. This is the first one which will only be about training and career pathways, but we'll also talk about um, clinical aspects. We'll talk about uh, life in the UK, some advice and more details about Caesar and so on. So there's a lot in the pipelines, but this is the first one. And hopefully this will help um, get people more settled. Um, it's a presentation, but it's more of a discussion based. If you guys have any questions, please interrupt at any point. Let me know what you think. If you have anything or any thoughts for the other for the others in the group as well, let me know. And we can always share and discuss. So it's um, it's not a teaching, it's a four. So um, we'll start. I've covered a few things to talk about. Um, we'll talk about the training pathways. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with these. But if anyone is not or has recently started, I will talk about it briefly so we know how the training pathways go. We'll talk about um, how to join the training system as an IMG, which posts you can join in, how to join in there, and so on. And we'll talk about the crest and the higher crest forms and how to get them signed as well if needed. We'll talk about other pathways. If you don't want to go into training or if you have other options that you want to consider, we'll talk about these as well. So if you have any questions about these or any things that we don't cover, please let me know. Always discuss. There's also the academic and postgraduate degrees, um, which we'll briefly touch about as well. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar, but the pathway in the UK is um, a bit long, longer than most countries. Um, this is a um, flowchart from a website called Road to UK, which is actually very good, very useful, and it just um, outlines the pathway. So when um, medical school is finished in the UK, they have two years of foundation, foundation year one and foundation year two. And when they finish the foundation, they enter into core training, which is either two years or three years, depending on the specialty, or directly into specialty ST1 in some specialties. Um, after they finish the core training or the first early years of training, they apply for ST3, which is the specialty training. This is when you specialize into a special uh, specialty. For example, if you're doing core surgery, you're doing rotations in all, all surgical specialties. But if you want to specialize in neurology, for example, then at ST3 level, this is when you actually just only do urology. And you follow this until ST8, and then you apply to become a consultant or with the CCD. This is the uh, training pathway for UK graduates or the standard pathway. Of course, it's a bit different and there are variations and are different pathways, but this is the outline of how most things are. Um, as IMGs, we usually don't do foundation here. We always almost always skip foundation year one because we do it in our home countries, which is the internship. And this is what I did as well. Um, foundation year two is similar, but you're more independent. You're, there's more expected of you. And UK graduates at this stage usually have the um, full GMC registration. So when they're in F1, they have the provisional registration, which is only for um, supervised or less uh, independent work. There's a lot expected of them, but they're still not fully registered. When they do for foundation year two, once they're more competent, they become fully registered all the way through. Um, as uh, IMGs, we usually start either at foundation year two, if you have done your internship in your home country, or higher if you have more experience. But most of us will have full GMC registration. And then you apply for core training and so on. So generally speaking, foundation, uh, if you want to start from foundation, you have the option to do a standalone foundation year two or the full foundation program. Um, standalone is easier, but it, it's a training, but it's um, 
it's a bit more difficult to get into and almost all UK graduates get into it. So there's only a few spaces left. It's useful because you don't have to worry about the crest form or anything like that, because at the end of the standalone, you get your competency signed. But most IMGs will do a non-training foundation uh, and get their crest form signed. There's something similar for core training. You can either run the formal core training or do a non-training core um, as an SHO for a year or two in the specialty you want. So um, after you do uh, a year or two, depending on your experience, you can join as a core trainee. There's a trust grade SHO, uh, junior clinical fellow, and all of these are the same thing. They are at core level or SHO level. After that, the specialty, which is ST3+, plus, this is when you either go in, into training or do a non-training registrar job. And this is what I'm doing at the moment. So I'm a non-training registrar job, but I'm applying for ST3 this year. Um, higher specialty later on, um, when you have more experience, you can either do a registrar job or you can do a higher uh, form of registrar training. And this can be, if you're in training program, you will be like ST6, ST7. If you're a non-training, you can do fellowships in special or sub-specialty, your specialty. For example, for plastic surgery, we have microsurgery fellowship, or we have a breast fellowship, or a burns fellowship, and so on. So you do a fellowship in something that's a sub-specialty of your specialty, which is actually quite useful, and it's a higher form of training. So you expected, there is more expected of you. There's also an, being an associate specialist, which is um, higher, even higher than being a registrar, but not quite at the consultant level yet. And some people, when they have enough experience, they can actually work as a locum consultant before being on a specialist register. And this gives them a lot of experience working as a consultant, but they, to get a permanent job as a consultant, you have to be on the specialist register, which is either through CCT or CSER. We'll talk about this as well. Any questions so far, any thoughts? Okay. So the training pathway, as I mentioned, is um, the standard. There is a bit of an update. Um, it's not really recent, but um, before 2019, there was something called the resident labor market test, which essentially meant that if you are not a resident in the UK, then you don't have the priority to apply for training. This made it very, very difficult for people to join training, and this is why a lot of people don't even consider it. But this was abolished in 2019 until now. And because all medical specialties now are on the shortage occupation list, everyone from whether they have a residency or not is able to apply and compete equi equally with all the uh, UK graduates or residents. So this is why training is much more accessible now since 2019. And this is why training options are more open now for IMGs. Um, to join training, there are a few things that you need to fulfill depending on the training stage you want to join. All of these will have uh, published criteria on the website. Um, essential criteria are something that's absolute. For example, if you want to apply for ST3 training, so you must have either MRCP or MRCS or some essential criteria. You have to have a certain ex uh, years of experience amount. Uh, before you can apply. So these are essential and almost everyone applying will have these. And because there are so many, they also have to compete and pick the best candidates. That's why the, that's where the portfolio and scoring system comes in. So even though you may fulfill the essential criteria, it doesn't guarantee training. You have to work on your portfolio and the other aspects. We'll talk about this as well. So you can join training. And there is a timeline. So most training applications start in around uh, November. The adverts appear, October, November time. Um, the uh, interviews usually are January, February, maybe March. And the training starts in August. For example, if you want to join August uh, training, for example, August 2023, then the applications will be uh, from November last year, so November 2022. So it's quite a long process and you have to prepare for it so you don't miss the opportunity. And some specialty, they have the re-advert. The re-advert is a second round of applications, which is around February when they start. Um, but it's it's different and almost 
uh, all specialties don't have this anymore. Um, there's a bit of a confusion about something called around two and around one we advert. They are different. So around two uh, refers to the ST3 applications and round one refers to the ST1 or CT applications. So they are different and this is not the re-advert. The re-advert is when they have uh, posted for a training job, they got candidates, but they didn't have enough candidates applying. So they do another uh, round. This is called the re-advert and it's different from being a round two advert. Any questions about this? I have one question. It says portfolio and scoring. Yeah. Uh, are they two separate entities or is there like a certain score as an exam scores? No, so scoring is um, when you apply for training, depending on the specialty, they will have a self assessment score. Um, when you apply, they ask you questions and you fill on the application form. The, for example, you get points for research, points for teaching, points for leadership, points for um, your experience in the specialty and so on. And these scoring systems are used to do a short listing and whether you get invited to an interview or not will depend on these. The portfolio is useful for this, but the uh, score is what determines your eligibility. That's why it's important to work on these. OK, thank you. Um, OK, so you guys probably all heard about Crest form. Do you know what it stands for? So it's a certificate of readiness to enter specialty training or the Crest form. And it's essentially um, it's a form that means that you are as qualified as someone who has finished foundation, which means that you are capable of doing the same things that someone who has finished foundation E2 is able to do. It's an alternative competency. So if you have done a foundation program like a formal standalone or a formal foundation program in the UK, then you don't need this. But most IMGs will need this um, form signed. It's actually very straightforward. It needs you to be able to. Sorry, let me close the door. It's a bit noisy. Hi guys, sorry. So I was saying uh, the Chris form means that you are as qualified as someone in foundation or has finished foundation, I mean, and um, this allows you to apply for training. This is the only reason you might need it. And it's easy to get signed. All you need to do is to work with a consultant who has observed you doing these skills for three months. And if they're happy to sign it, then you can get the form signed. And essentially, you are as qualified as someone who's finished foundation year two. That's the theoretical application of it. It's a bit more tricky to get it signed depending on the consultant. Some consultants are picky because you have to do a lot of competence, but it's very basic stuff. So uh, seeing patients, managing acute emergencies, doing cannulation, doing an ECG, all basic stuff that you learn anyway on the job. And it's easy to get signed if you agree with your supervisor or one of the consultants to observe you, see how you're doing, and by if after a few months, you can have a chat together or a meeting and they can sign it for you. It's quite straightforward uh, to sign and it's useful. It's one of the essential criteria, so you can't apply for training unless you have a Crest form for this training. Um, there's something, this is the uh, link for it. Uh, if you search Crest form, this is the last one, which is 2021, which is the one that you need to use. And it has all the tick boxes that you need to fill. So it's very straightforward if you want to go through it. And like I said, if you plan it with your consultant, it's easy to get signed. And this allows you to join at the CT or ST level here. So you're as qualified as someone who has finished foundation year two, and you can apply for core training. Uh, all clear? And this form, does it get signed by our clinical supervisor or educational? Any consultants. So it has, doesn't have to be your supervisor, but that's the easiest pathway, yeah. And usually you have a meeting with your clinical or education supervisor at the beginning. And if you talk about this, then you can plan to have it signed. They can just keep an eye on, on things. Thank you. But yes, that's it.
It doesn't have to be anyone, uh, just a consultant at any point. Um, remember that they have to sign all the tick boxes. So if one of them is not signed, then the form is not valid. You have to make sure that they sign everything. And if there's something they're not happy to sign yet, then give them some time to see you do it and then sign it. OK. Uh, this will get you into core training, like I said. If you want to enter into ST3 level here, then you need a sp another form. So either you do a core training program. Again, if you do it, you don't need to worry about the other form. But if you don't and you have done some years as an SHO and you think you want to apply for ST3 directly, then this is when you need the CRIST hire form. Um, it's the same, it's called the CRIST form, but it's the certificate of readiness to um, apply for higher specialty training. So higher specialty is um, on this website, which is the HAE website. The, um, this is the body that does the national recruitment for all specialties. And they have a resource bank, which has all the forms. It has the CRIST form, it has the CRIST hire form as well. And like I said, this will allow you to apply at ST3 level. Of course, because this is this essentially means that you're as qualified as someone who has finished core training to so someone who finished CT2. It's a bit more demanding. They expect more of you. But again, if you have a meeting with your consultant to observe you and you think that you're as capable as someone who has finished core training, then they are usually happy to sign it. And um, again, this is needed. So if you if you don't have the form, then you can't apply for ST3. Um, and if you join ST3, you stay there for, like I said, um, until ST8, so six years, and then you apply to become a consultant. Um, but not everyone has to apply for training. It's not the only pathway, and it, sometimes it's not the best pathway either. So there are alternative pathways. Has anyone heard of the Caesar? No? or is it CCT? So essentially these two are the only ways for you to become on the specialist register. There's something older called the Caesar CP, which is not in use anymore. It's something that was given to someone who uh, joined training from ST3 level directly, instead of being core training and then ST3. Uh, this is no longer the case and it doesn't apply and everyone who joins from ST3 will get a CCT now, which is Certificate of Completion of Training, which means that they can become a consultant. CESAR is different. CESAR means that you didn't join training and you did your own uh, training in the UK as a trust grade. You worked for five or six years or whatever and you got all your forms signed and you're saying that you are as qualified as a consultant essentially. It's a rigorous process because you have to prepare a lot of paperwork, a lot of evidence, and you have to apply to a committee to get it approved. So it's a bit difficult, but it is possible. I know a lot of people who have done the Caesar. Instead of going into training, they just do their own trust grade jobs and get their paperwork done and then become consultants. So it is possible, but it is much more difficult, of course. The other option is to become a, an associate speci specialist. This is um, essentially someone who um, focuses on a specific area. They are not as qualified as a consultant, so they don't cover all the aspects of their um, of their specialty, but they are well trained and they have a lot of experience and they work as an associate specialist in a certain area. They can't work independently, so there's always a consultant, but a lot of them have a massive amount of experience. And it's usually most of them would have chosen this pathway because they don't care about the paperwork or they don't want to bother with all this nonsense. So they choose to do this and have a work life balance. So it's a different pathway as well. And it's also an end of training pathway, which is some people consider as well. Um, there are pros and cons, of course, to each. So if you join the training pathway, you have security because you know at the end of your training, you will get a CCT no matter what. So you finish the six years, you get your CCT or consult. You don't have to worry about collecting all your paperwork and uh, will, will it get approved? Will it get rejected? Will, do I have to work for a few more years to get more paperwork and so on? So there is security if you join the training. 
and there's stability because you're usually in one deanery which covers one area of the UK. So for example, here it's Thames Valley Deanery, which covers Oxford and uh, Aylesbury here. I think um, Salisbury, I think, is part of it. I'm not sure. But all in the same region, so you don't have to go into Scotland, for example, or go west or go and so on. You stay in one area and you're able to buy a house if you want to buy a house and so on. And as a trainee, you have a priority for training, of course. So um, they are obligated to teach you and you, they are obligated to uh, make sure that you fulfill all the checklist to become a consultant. So it's more stable, but of course it has some cons. Uh, for example, you don't have any freedom. You stay in the same deanery and you follow their own training pathway. It is, uh, this is not the case in non-training pathway. So you can choose where you want to work, you can choose where you want to stay, and you can do uh, fellowships, for example, abroad, if you want to go to um, another country and do a fellowship and come back. So it's much easier to do this as a non-trainee. It can be shorter as a non-trainee, but it can also be longer because you don't have to work for the full six years before you get a CCT. If you have a lot of experience in your home country, then you don't always have to wait six more years to become a consultant. If you have a lot of experience and you can just apply after a year or two. Um, as a non-trainee, also you get usually get paid more because you're not on the national um, standard rates. You can negotiate and if you have a lot of experience then you can get paid a lot more as well. Uh, training is also very competitive, especially in some specialties. So that's why it's difficult to get into. This is not the case in non-training. You don't have to compete with anyone. You just have to fill your own paperwork. That's the pro of non-training. Any question about this? So if someone finishes SCT2. Uh, yeah. Is that when they decide? Uh, yes, please. Can you bring up the slide? Yes. Yeah. So if they finish the S uh, C T two, do they go to the non training pathway? When when is it decided when you can go through the non training pathway? So it's not decided. It's a choice you make. You can always. Um, so usually here, if you finish core training, you're out of training now, and you have to apply again. So if you do core training one and two, and you finish then you have to apply again for ST3, similar to everyone else. Mm -hmm. And at this point, you can either carry on as being a trust grade job uh, somewhere, or if you want to, um, if you get into training, then you can start your training. But if you don't want to continue into the training pathway, then you can just do your own rotation and finish with a Caesar. Or if you apply for a year and you don't get it, another year and you don't get it and so on, then you can carry on as a non-trainee and become with the Caesar route or SAS. Uh, all everyone who applies for core training has to apply again at ST3 level. Um, and a lot of people who have not done core training can still apply for ST3 level and become in the training pathway as well. So it's entirely about, it depends on your own choice. If you want to get into training, if you don't, and what you want to do. Most people want to go into training, but like I said, it's not, uh, essential. It's not the only pathway. There are different pathways. This is the easiest and most reliable way, and it's to get into training, but it's not always um, the best for everyone, of course. So, if um, what the completion of C two, what's that equivalent in the in the US? C T two. Yeah. So it's different in the US because they go straight into residency. So after medical school, they go straight into something similar to ST, but they only have five years. In the UK, it's different because they have two years of core training and six years of ST training. So eight years in total. So that's a bit longer. Uh, finishing core training means that you're essentially someone who has finished the first year of residency. But they have to apply again to become into the um, to finish the residency essentially and become an attending in the US. And then once they go to the US and they finish their residency program mm -hmm. and then they come back that then you apply with the C with Caesar. Uh, it's different because it's not always accepted here as the same training. That's why it's different. So for example, um, 
they don't have MRCS, for example, or MRCP, so they can't apply for ST3 until they do it. That's okay. one of the essential criteria. But okay. if they have a lot of experience in the US or they have already uh, are board certified in the US, sometimes you have to apply and they can get in special circumstances become consultants here. But I don't think I've ever heard of anyone coming from the US to the UK. I think it's always vice versa. Okay. And it's it's a different system, so it's not very comparable. But essentially, yeah, so essentially the residency in the US equates to the core training and ST training combined. Okay. They, yeah, they also there, they work much more hours, so they work longer hours and they stay there for, and in the residency they work much more. So that's why it's a bit shorter. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Any other questions, guys? Okay, I know it's a bit complex, but I'll have this uh, recorded. I'll have it on the website. You can always look it up again, and I'll I can email you guys or send you this uh, presentation as well. So you can always look back to it if you want to look uh, look up anything, or if you have any question, just message me at any point. I don't have that much experience. I've only been in the UK for three years, but. I've read a lot about this, so I might be able to answer some of your questions. There are people who can give you more details as well, if you want. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is academia, because it's an area of uh, confusion. Um, I'm from Egypt, so a lot of uh, in medical school in, in Egypt, a lot of us uh, do a master's degree during the residency, and essentially that's how you progress. It's very different. I think this is the case in a lot of countries, but this is different in the UK. In the UK, the clinical uh, route and the academic route are very separate. So if you have done a master's, this does not mean anything for your training uh, or your clinical training. So like I said, in the UK, you do a foundation, core, specialty, and then end of training. But if you do a master's degree or a PhD or an MD or, or so on, it doesn't mean that you will progress faster. For example, you can skip core if you do a master's. No, that's not the case. It doesn't work like this. A master's is useful if you want to do something in addition or supplement to your clinical practice. For example, if you're interested in research, if you're interested in uh, teaching and so on, then you can do a master's in this. And this is a supplement. It's, it does not affect your clinical work, doesn't affect you becoming a consultant, but it gives you more options to work in other areas or aspects of the medical career. Uh, for example, if you want to do uh, teaching as a consultant, if you want to be a professor in a university, if you want to do uh, research, lead your clinical trials and so on, then you have to think about doing a master's or a PhD. But this is, and again, like I said, additional to your training. So you still do the whole 10 years of training, and additionally do some more years or a uh, part-time master's or so on. A lot of people do uh, a year out of training to do this, and this can be at different stages. So you can do it after your foundation, for example. So a lot of people in the UK do an F3. You'll hear them talking about I'm doing an F3 or I'm doing an academic foundation program, for example. So they are designed to give you more time to, do, uh, to look into research or to do another degree, for example. So you can do this at your foundation. You can do in your core or after your core, for example, as in CT3. Again, this is time out of training. So this is like an extra year and you do it to get yourself more points, but it does not affect your clinical experience at all. It doesn't make it shorter to become a consultant or skip parts. You still have to do the whole thing. So you can do it in foundation, you can do it in core training, you can do it during your specialty. If you're in training, you either join um, something called an academic clinical fellowship, which is like um, a different category of training, but it's very, very competitive. I think they have like five or six in every specialty in the whole UK. So it's very competitive. Usually people with a lot of experience in research get into that. Or you can do an out of program, uh, time. So, for example, in the six years of your special training, you can apply and take a year or two out to do a master's degree and then come back. For example, if you do it in your ST4, then at the end of ST4, you go out of the program, you spend a year or two doing a master or a PhD or whatever, 
and come back and start from ST5 again. So you don't skip, you just add it. Uh, but this will allow you to, when you are at the end of your training, to do other things. So if you want to do um, research more, if you're interested in teaching or being a professor or, or uh, in education in, in a university, then you can think about these. If you are interested in leadership and doing some management roles or leading the hospital and so on, then you can do some research into that or masters in, re in leadership, interested in innovation, technology and so on. So this is like an additive that allows you to do more as a consultant than just being a clinician. You can do more by doing these or adding these to your own pathway. I'm sure you guys have heard of uh, of the a lot of these terms. Uh, a lot of UK um, graduates do an intercalated uh, BSc. So this means that during the medical school, instead of doing four years or five years, they have an extra year where they do a research uh, project for a year and then they come out with a PSC. A lot of people do that, but they have to pay a lot more because they are on a loan and they do an extra year. So some people don't, but this is one part that they do. This is for undergraduates. So I don't think it's applicable to most IMGs now. The things that are applicable to IMGs are these three. So the easiest and the shortest one is something called the BG CERT or postgraduate certification. Uh, this is something that can be done, for example, in medical education or in surgery or in research. It's called the BG CERT, which is like um, something slightly uh, less complex than a master's. It takes between nine months and 12 months to finish, and it has a few modules. You can do it part time, you can do it online, and it gives you a PG CERT in the end. So you have you have a, like a title of a PG CERT, which you can use. For example, a lot of people do a PG CERT in medical education, which is useful, but it is not a master's but it opens the door to doing a master if you want. Or you can do a master's degree straight away, which in the UK is between one and two years. There's two types. It's uh, either taught master's, which is essentially like going to the university, taking courses and so on. So most of this is full time. So you have to take time out of your clinical practice to do this. Or sometimes there's part time master's, which is usually over two years. And the next step is to do a PhD, of course, which is four years, and this will allow you to become a professor if you carry on this pathway. This is all, like I said, extra. Not everyone do that, does this. Uh, I would say like 10% of people do stuff like that, but it helps open doors, open doors to you if you want to do other uh, aspects other than clinical. The only thing to be aware of, um, I'm sure a lot of you like me are on uh, a visa in the UK and it's a tier two visa or healthcare uh, visa. And when you apply for a master's or a PhD, unfortunately you are treated as an overseas. And the fees for doing a master's, for example, is about triple. For example, if you, some of them will be about 15,000 pounds if you want to do a master's, as compared to someone who lives in the UK, they will only pay like 5,000. So it's a bit more, um, expensive, a bit more difficult. Um, a lot of people do this to get into training, which is actually not a good idea. I'll talk about this in a second. But like I said, if you want to do other um, pathways or other careers, the easiest way to start if you're a junior is to start with a PG cert, which um, is not as expensive, it's shorter and doesn't um, doesn't separate between uh, UK uh, residents and non-residents. So you pay the same fees. Masters is more complex. And again, like I said, you have to pay more, but you can look for sponsorship, which is a bit more complex, needs more time to talk about this, but it's another option. Or you can do it after you obtain your residency. So you don't have to pay uh, international fees. You only pay the uh, home fees, which is easier, much easier. But of course, everyone has their own choices. Any questions? I know this is a bit of a complex area. Sorry, uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned it or not, but how do you mm -hmm. apply for PG cert? So, yes, um, research project. 
Yes, so there is a PhD research in medical education, in research, in surgery, in medicine, in different aspects, in leadership, and they are all offered by universities. So there's a website I can send to everyone um, that sort of like looks into the universities and they put adverts for their own um, PG certs and you can just browse them. So there's a university of Scotland in uh, London, Imperial College and so on. They all have PG cert programs and you just apply for it uh, through the website. So it's an uh, online application and you pay the fees and essentially you are enrolling into this university to do this PG cert. There's a lot of them. There's some with the Royal Colleges who offer them as well. So they're easy to find. And they have different fees. So depending on how prestigious the university is, of course. But they are essentially all the same. And some of them are cheap. I think they are about between 2,000 and 3,000 pounds for the whole year. And like I said, you can get sponsorship sometimes. Um, sometimes from the trust. I'm not sure how. I haven't done my, one myself. but. Essentially, you can get some funding and they are not not as expensive as others and gives you an edge. So that's a good starting point. And you apply for them online. I'll send the, the link to everyone so you can look into options if you want. Thank you, Muhammad. And um, also with regards to the um, visa, if you're on a PG cert, does that mean that you're not going to be on a tier two visa anymore? No, no, no. So it's... Um, most of these are uh, part time. So you do them like in the evenings or in the weekends and you just do some uh, modules and do some essays and then you end with the PG set. So you can do it in addition to your clinical work. So they are easy to do. Um, if you want to do that full time and leave your job, yes, unfortunately you have to leave your visa because they don't offer sponsorship for a tier two visa. So if you want to do something like this full time, you will not be on a visa unless if you're lucky enough and you negotiate with the trust to give you uh, time out. You stay with the trust and they give you um, nine months, for example, unpaid to do this PG cert and come back. I think this is very difficult to arrange, but some people might be able to do that if they are. Um, they have been working the trust for a year or two, for example, or if they have uh, good relations with the uh, HR and so on. So it's possible, but most of, most people do it as a part time. So they do it with their clinical work. Um, I'll talk about why they are not essential for training. So if you want to do something like this, you have to think about it carefully because it's a lot of work and it might not be as useful as you think. Unless you want to do something on the long run. OK. OK, thank you. So right. Um, so, like I said, academia and clinical do not replace each other. So if you want to progress into the clinical work, you have to carry on with the pathway of uh, foundation, co-training and so on. Um, if you want to do these things, they sometimes remember the scoring I talked about with training. Some people do this because they give them extra points for training applications and they think that this is useful. But if you think about it and balance between the cost and benefit, it's very time consuming, it's very expensive, and it does not give as many points as people think. So if you want to use, some people will think about doing these to get into ST3, for example. So if I do a master's degree, for example, then I would be, I'm sure to get a, a training job. That's not the case. It's going to give you like one or two extra points, which are not going to make a difference at all. And, but in, on the other hand, you will be doing a lot of extra work, a lot of time, and a lot of money is paid into that. So if you're doing this to become uh, to join the training, I don't recommend it at all. If you're doing it, however, because you are interested in academia and you want to do something on the long run, then yes, that's a different story. This is, yes, you can think about it and invest in doing something like that for uh, something in the future. But if a lot of people would think about doing this for training, and I really don't recommend that. OK. So I know we talked about a lot of things, but like I said, this will all be recorded. And if you have any questions, let me know. Um, any questions at all from anyone? About any of this so training, non-training, Caesar and so on.
Yeah, great. So I put some um, questions that most people ask and think about. Um, I'm sure it has come across some of your minds. So um, a lot of people are thinking, what can I do to prepare for specialty training and how can I actually get scores and so on? So it depends on the specialty you want to do. Um, the most useful thing is to look at the self-assessment score and see what gives which points and prepare accordingly. For example, if I'm applying for plastic surgery, I look up the checklist, see which uh, categories give more points and work on that. For example, if I do a, a good audit, I will get so and so points. So I'll think about doing an audit, for example. If I do some teaching, then I'll get some teaching points. And again, this will give me more points to apply. So it's very useful to find the specialty you want to apply for and see <coughs> and see what they are looking for and try to work on that. So audit, research, teaching, leadership are all common themes in all specialty trainings. But um, the points are variable. And if you think about getting the most points that you can get, then you can plan accordingly. Most people will take about a year or so at least to start working on these. But depends on the specialties. Some specialties are not as competitive and you might need to um, do a lot of work. For example, GP training, they need a massive number of uh, people applying, so it's easier to get into. Same for psychiatry, some uh, A and E and so on. So it's easier to get into and you don't have to put as much work into preparing. But if you're applying for a competitive specialty um, like cardiology, uh, uh, plastic surgery, uh, cardiothoracics and so on, these are uh, more competitive and you have to think about how to prepare from an early stage. Uh, um, I'm not, you're all in the UK now, so you all have some NHS experience, but a lot of people ask, can they apply for training directly without being in the UK? Yes, you can. It's not uh, something I recommend, but a lot of people do that and it's, it's possible so long as you fulfill the essential criteria, like I said, and so long as you um, have enough score or enough points to get a job and into training. It's not always possible. I don't recommend it myself because, as you know, the system is very difficult to get used to. It takes a few months to get used to the system here. And if you start as a training, this will have a negative impact on your training because this is all counted and you're losing months of your training. You might not be able to progress as you wanted. But this is personal choice, of course. The CRIST and the CRIST higher form, you can actually sign them in your home country if you want. So if you worked in your home country for a year or two and you worked with a consultant there, then you can actually get them to sign it for you so you don't have to sign it here. Um, they might be a bit more um, difficult to accept them. They might be a bit more um, critical when they review it and so on, but you can theoretically get it signed by someone who is not in the UK, but you have to also add the registration. So the registration certificate, you have to copy it, translate it and add it with your quest form. But it is possible if you want to do that. It's easier to sign here, so I'm not sure why people will do that, but if you want, you can. The, there's a question about master's degree and why it's, if it's required. It's not. Like I said, it's a separate pathway. And yes, MD, MS, and so on. These are not equivalent to core training. They are not clinical. They are additives or supplements. Um, this is a list of a few useful resources. They might be a bit um, older, but they are useful. So the, the, sites we, the site, website we have is useful, of course. A few have any questions, if you want to join the activities, it will all be there on the IMG website that we have. And you can also register for the forum. We have Dr. Rodney De Palma. He's a consultant in cardiology who's also from Italy, I think, and IMG. He's going to talk about Caesar route and he's going to go into details about this as well, which is it's going to be a very useful session. We haven't planned when yet, but it's probably going to be within the next um, two or three sessions. So I suspect probably by next month we'll have a date for it. And I really recommend you guys come for this. It's going to be very useful. And it will be one of these forum sessions. So like an hour at lunchtime. There is a lot of Facebook groups. I'm sure you guys are on, on them and they are a lot of questions. You can always ask questions there as well. There's a lot of people helping. The Road to UK website is useful. It has a lot of blog posts 
with information and details. I got the um, timeline from them, so it's useful. There is a website called Omar's Guidelines. It's also very useful and goes into details about um, training and non-training and the paperwork and so on. You can always have it as a reference if you want. Applying for training appears on a website called Oriel, and the specialty training website is the HEE, um, Health Education England, which is the uh, governing um, sort of body for all training applications in the UK. So look, look them up and they will always have useful resources as well. That's everything actually. Uh, does anyone have any questions at all? Great. I hope it was useful, guys. And like I said, I'll put this on the website so everyone can uh, view it later on if needed. Um, guys, can I ask a question? Is there anything else you want to do or talk about in the next forum sessions, or should I plan something more generic? Like any requests? I can't think of anything specific right now. OK, that's fine. If you have any ideas or if there's something you want to talk about, you can always email me or text me. I'm on the WhatsApp group. Um, could cover anything you guys want and talk about it or bring speakers to talk about them. Um, the next session will be in two weeks. I'll send an email as well or in, on the WhatsApp group. And um, I'll see you guys then. Hope you enjoy the rest of your leave. Bazaar. Thank you, Muhammad. Thank you. Appreciate it. Of course. Thank Take you. Care. And thank you so much for the session. Of course. Happy to help. Take care. See you. Bye.